future we will really need to talk about all right hey everyone thank you for joining us today so today we have <clears throat> the Shifting the Focus Youth Seminar, and we're joined today by Colonel Hunton, Sean Smith over here, Vice Chairwoman of Fulton County District 4, Natalie Hall, the Honorable Judge Angela Brown. Where's that extra? Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Pastor Lisa Musser, Attorney Gerald Griggs, Executive Director of Atlanta North Georgia Labor Council, Sandra Williams, District Attorney Patsy Austin Gatson from Gwinnett County, and Attorney Gerald Griggs. Hey, everybody. Thank you. I'm so sorry. We've had a few technical issues today. But today, um, Black Push is hosting this event to kind of talk about shifting the focus youth seminar. Um, this is all about how to deal with our interactions with law enforcement. We're going to talk about learning about jobs of the future, education. Um, making the most change in your community as a team and where we are headed in the future. So first off, I want to say thank you to all our panelists. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so I want to start off because I know we have Miss Sandra. She's going to be getting off earlier. So earlier this week, we had the great opportunity of partnering with Miss Sandra and her organization. Um, and she's the executive director of and introduce yourself, Miss Sandra. I'm so sorry. You could do it better than I can. Thank you. 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 So we went to the Department of Labor to protest earlier this week. Um, as you guys know, the minimum wage takeaway, I guess, um, that the governor is getting ready to, or not the minimum wage takeaway, I'm sorry, the unemployment takeaway, where they're getting ready to take away the $300 that people are getting um, per month. So I wanted you to talk to Ms. Sandra about how the impact of that bill, how it's going to impact youth, um, how it's going to impact families. Yes, definitely. So as that impacts families, think about it this way. With the pandemic, and we have not gotten out of the woods yet, I know we have 30% mm -hmm. of Georgians who have received both of the vaccinations. Yep. But that's not we have 11 million people in the state. We have clusters within schools where a town has is diagnosed with COVID gives it to a teacher, the school closes. So now you're back in a situation where the mom or dad have to go back home to take care of a child that's in a virtual learning program. That's not consistent with family values that we've been hearing for years from the GOP or from others. So what we're asking is restoration of the pandemic unemployment assistance, open the doors to the Georgia DO well. To be a citizens council and attorney Griggs, I think you were very much involved in that lawsuit to say, listen, you're supposed to have a council that can be a worker, labor, of course, employers, but people that provide oversight and input into the Department of Labor and what they're actively doing. If she had the opportunity to go back and for additional funding from the state legislature because they are on the staff and have been on the staff mm -hmm. for a while. They need new technology. He did not ask for any additional assistance, monetary yeah. assistance. So we say, I would, but we say with the governor, we can 
people that have working families that they're it's a part of their interests. Mm -hmm. So let me have a good question from you. I hope I answered your question. Oh no, no, absolutely. So my question is for everybody on here. Um, one of the things that's extremely important to me recently has been the way we deal with education. And everybody here on this panel, oh, wow, you don't change your background up. I see you, Judge Angela <laughs> Brown. Um, but everybody on this panel can, I think everybody can relate to how important education is. <laughs> how important education is. So I want everybody to kind of jump in and talk about how important education is. It's definitely in your field of what you do. And I'll start with Colonel Hunting because you're on the top of my screen. So, sorry, sir. I'm trying to get it on. I'm not too good with technology. Thank y'all for having me. Um, education is going to be very important. Um, it doesn't matter ethnicity. It doesn't matter your background. Um, that's one of the key things to uh, help with uh, reducing poverty and things of that nature is having the education in place uh, for all. And so I don't get into the uh, the politics because I'm not a politician. I serve my community here in Paulding County and we do the best that we can to help our citizens here. But uh, education is very important. Hey, Disco, you know what? Go to the next question. All right. If I could get Natalie Hall to tell us about how education helps her in her field and the importance. Hi, Chairwoman. Great. I'm so excited to have a Chairwoman on the, the team. Oh, it's fantastic. A lot of the Atlanta Public Schools representative districts inside of my district. So I work with those elected officials that are on the Atlanta Board of Education to ensure that the families and children that attend Atlanta Public Schools receive the kind of services that they need. And Fulton County has so many services because we're mandated by the state to provide public school services. And everything is free to our Fulton County residents because it is their taxpayers' dollars at work. So as, as it relates to education, I find it very important that our children have the resources that they need and their families because if we're going home to see our families that we need food or help, uh, or any type of resource as far as housing, anything that Fulton County offers, things that can be a distraction to their education. So that's how I help in that area. That's awesome. Yes, I um went to school six through K here in Georgia in Cobb County, actually. And um, I'm in college now. I'm a sociology student. And one of the things we find the most is exactly what you're talking about, where students are um, that lack security at home are having a harder time in school. The most Atlanta public schools that have 100 percent free and reduced lunch. So that means that the families in those schools are living at the poverty level or below the poverty level. So I try to find ways to bring the Fulton County services and programs to them to help their experience be much better that's awesome i wow a hundred percent free reduced lunch that's awesome like i'm in awe because it's so hard to get free and reduced lunch based on income of your parents all right let's move on to the honorable judge angela brown how is education important which i know it is in your field um, I'm a law school hopeful, so anything you can say, I would love to hear. I just think that education is important for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the studies have shown that there is a pipeline directly from those who cannot pass the third grade or, do, or start falling behind in third grade straight to prison. And so we have to get involved no with the education of mm -hmm. our youth. I mean, think about it. We have people who can't read um, at a, a base level mm -hmm. who are out here um, in society and and really just um, getting along. If you come in front of uh, 
a judge or if you're involved in the legal system, already you're at a disadvantage. You've got to be yeah. able to um, not be able to interact with the people. You, if you're being represented, you have got to be able to make sure that the person who is representing you is doing what they're supposed to do. Um, Absolutely. I sentence people, if they don't have a GED or a, a, a high school diploma or some kind of certificate um, to work by, I require that. Um, and I know some people think, oh, that's just extra and it's kind of ridiculous to do, but it makes a big difference. It you does. Know? The bullet, the weapon, if you say in our society today, if you want a weapon, then you need to educate your child. Mm -hmm. right? The pen is mightier than the sword. You to look at processes and question, well, why are we doing this? You know, if you think about when you were younger, or, or those of us who have had who have children, um, you know, when they're two and three, everything is why? Mm -hmm. Why? Why? At some point in time, we lose that. I mean, if you, if you want to have a uh, if you want to be on the bench, you can be on the bench like me, but you got to have education, right? You got to go yeah. to 12 years of high school. You got to go into college, four years of college, and then you got to go to three years of law school. You want to be a police officer, guess what? You still have to have an education. That might be part of the problem, but, you know, you've got to go through um, high school. Um, if you some go to college and then go into the force, but even when you get there, you have to go through education and constant education, constant thing. Whatever you want to do, um, you put your mind to do it, you can do it. And if you want to go to college and, and it looks like you, your parents can't afford it or you can't get there, you can get there. There are scholarships. There are churches have scholarships. People will give you money to go to school if if they come alongside of you and you and you tell them your story, I want to be a district attorney, just like um, district attorney Austin Yates. <laughs> and you tell them why, you tell them where you're from. People, I, I just believe, and I know, you know, it, it is separate uh, from, from being a judge, but I just believe that God puts people and resources in our paths. And we just need to ask for it, and they will, people will go through great lengths to help other people. You see stuff on the television, somebody trying to go to college. If you all remember the story about the young man who, who was walking to college every single day to get to his classroom. Mm -hmm. They put it on TV, people bought him a car, people gave him money so he could move closer because it is in our nature to try and help people who are trying to do something with education gotta have it so you know there there are people who want to help you get it absolutely and we're going to kind of um shift i want to hear from da Pesky da austin gets it woo hey, uh i i love all these law schools she, listen to them she does great <laughs> on introductions obviously i need to roll back <laughs> but we love to hear from you too about education why is it important to the da's office i mean um I, we had a great opportunity this week Actually, and for those who don't know, um, Pastor Muster, who's over in the right-hand corner, we hosted um, churches at, in her church in Gwinnett, and there's about 20 churches that came out. Um, and DA Patsy Austin Gaston couldn't make it, but she sent somebody who I've a, a DA Daryl <laughs> man. <laughs> um, she sent him, and um, the Gwinnett Police Department actually sent out two officers who heard from the community. But why is education so important if a person is trying to pursue the job of being the next DA? Well, um, I'm going to go back a little further because I found out about a statistic when I was running for this office, and it was shocking to me that 52% of the kindergartners in Gwinnett County are not prepared, not ready for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's inexcusable in any community that the children are not ready. And um, I think what I told people during my campaign is that we can all do something. If it means buying a book for a child, reading to a child. The one thing I love about Gwinnett County is that people are more collaborative right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do have the feeding programs in the summer for the kids, you know, that have to worry about, um, you know, food insufficiency when school is out. So they have feeding programs set up. And I think, you know, as a community, we have to be involved with the community because 
if children are being educated, if they're seeing that they have a hope in the future, and I think that's what education brings. It brings you to understand that you have hope in the future. It's just like, you know, the other panelists have said, just put it out there. You know, if you have a dream, you can go places. If you're not dreaming, you're not going any place. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the first college graduate in my family, and um, I'm the youngest of six children. And we were not set up. I was not set up from any uh, special um, situation where I was put ahead of anybody. You know, I feel like I had to strap. I wanted something in my life. Um, I grew up sometimes in projects, sometimes we lived in houses, but I see that, you know, there's a struggle that we all have to go through, and I think that um, any child out there has to understand that we love them, that they have hope, that there's a future for them, and I think education has been the door for a lot of people to walk through so that they can have a better life for themselves and for their family. So I think education is imperative, um, but it just concerns me when I see from our SROs and our schools here in Gwinnett County, where even elementary school children are bringing weapons to school. And this is something as a society, we all better get educated. You know, I don't care how many degrees you have, you can continue your education to help someone else out pull ahead. But this is something that we have to do as a community. We all have to give back. We have to make children know. We have to make young adults understand that we care about them. And we have to do something. We can't just sit back and say, you know, I got mine, now you go get yours. Right. Not that so. Yeah, I think it Absolutely. goes back to the whole aspect of um, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Yes. Um, and I think we have to get back to that principle. You know, the funny thing is that for those of us who work in the spiritual community, they don't see the spiritual community as being a place where you need education. But Pastor Mercer, I know me and you definitely dis disagree with that. Um, <laughs> you definitely need education. I had uh, actually before I got in ministry, my old pastor, Dr. Matt King Carter, used to always say that if you're going to be in ministry, you have to have a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in another because you have to be able to relate real life issues to what people are going through now. But Pastor Mercer, I want you to speak on education from that standpoint. Okay, well, thank you, Sean. Um, it is important to teach us, you know, it's more than book knowledge. I mean, education is where children learn how to interact with each other. They learn structure. Um, for some children, sadly, um, it's an escape from a bad situation at home. And um, I would also like to make the, you know, the parents and the youth that are watching this, um, those that are 14 or 18 are mostly there or coming out of um, school, but, you know, for to me personally, it's a, it's a, it, it is a human right, but I'm saying to me that's very important that it's a basic human right. And the Constitution of this country affords every single child a free education, an education that it's equal opportunity, no matter what the child, um, what they experience to that point. What I appreciate about the education system is that it's it levels the playing field at a young age. So whether the person is poor, even whether they're a citizen or a non-citizen, regardless of their gender, regardless of their ethnic background, regardless of their religion, they're entitled to a free education. And so the fact that it is a basic human right, um, you know, I encourage uh, young people, and this is a struggle for a lot of young people, and then a lot of, um, kids get moved around from state to state, and it's just hard for them to um, finish their education. Some kids, you know, stay in trouble a lot, get expelled from multiple schools. They still have a constitutional right, a human right, to a free education. And that's very important. Um, I understand that we have a lot of youth listening, and I just want to speak to them for a quick second and encourage you that, you know, I have personally been involved in children who have been, they've been expelled from schools, they've, they've gone through all kinds of, they've done homeschooling, then they've gone to the alternative schools, and whatever it takes, press through the adversity, just press through, if you're a young person, press through, because this is, this is a thing that will set you, keep you um, behind for the rest of your life. So press through whatever adversity, if you're 20 years old and you're in the sixth grade, it's okay press through. You need to get that education. 
under your belt so that you're not at a disadvantage for the whole rest of your life. It is your human right. It's your constitutional right. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. If you've been expelled from 10 schools, if you've been 20 states, stick with your education. It's your human right, and this country owes it to you according to our Constitution. So press through. I just encourage you, press through. At the end of the day, at the end of your life, you'll be glad you did when there's something that's free and that's your right. Um, you know, you take advantage of that. That's the first thing you can do just to set yourself up to be at a better place. So I just um, want to speak to the young people and encourage them, no matter what the adversity, no matter what, you know, you might be making all D's or whatever, get to graduate. Whatever it takes, graduate. Um, take summer school. Um, don't let your peers embarrass you or shame you or even adults or anybody. You get that. It's your right. It's your human right, and it's going to benefit you the rest of the days of your life. You know, it's crazy because I remember I was talking to my nephew um, recently or probably a while ago. And I told him, like, when my grandmother grew up in a generation where you didn't have to have a high school diploma, right, um, where you can actually go through and get a good job without a high school diploma. My mom grew up in a generation where a high school diploma was mandatory. And now we live in a generation where they want to see their college degree. They want a college degree. I mean, degree and a even master's. me working in the restaurant industry, <laughs> when people came in and they had, a, they were looking for management positions, I put the ones that had the college degree above everybody else. So I think that's important. And we have, listen, I'm not good at doing introductions, but we have the justice fighter on, uh, Mr. Gerald Griggs, <laughs> Attorney <laughs> Gerald Griggs. And for you, Attorney Gerald Griggs, I want you to talk to the youth about education, why it's so important for you as well. Well, I believe education. Um, I was blessed to basically be born in the classroom. Um, wow. My mother was a veteran of Atlanta Public School. She taught there for almost 40 years. Oh, wow. So from the point I could walk, I was in a classroom of some sort. And uh, I always remember the advice of my father. Uh, always told me that regardless of whatever grades you get, uh, Gerald, as long as you learn so that you can apply, that is the best uh, advice I could possibly give to you. So for the young people out there, yes, I want you to get good grades, but I also want you to understand the purpose of an education is so that you can empower yourself with tools that you can use the rest of your life. If you start looking at it that way, you can empower yourself to be an entrepreneur, to be a, a, a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, uh, invent something that hasn't been thought of yet. Those are the reasons why you go to school. It's not just to, to make a good grade. That's great. But if you can learn mathematics so you can apply it to become an accountant, if you can learn English so you can become a reporter, if you can learn logic so you can become an attorney, it becomes relevant to the rest of your life. So what I always teach my daughter, and I'm actually up here uh, in Gwinnett County at uh, Sugarloaf Middles, I'm about to pick her up. But I always impart on her the same way my father imparted on me is find something that you're passionate about. You know, I was passionate about arguing and debating. <laughs> and so I learned how to read the encyclopedia. And y'all know I'm dating myself just a little old. Oh, I've so, read the 1996 you know, encyclopedia. I don't know what that is. know about a subject <laughs> so that when you go in and debate this subject, um, I understand that transition first then to what I do as an attorney. And you guys have the most powerful encyclopedia ever. You guys have smartphones where you can learn absolutely anything. I've been on this, this past pandemic, I've been on YouTube learning graphic design. Mm -hmm. Again, graphic design is an attorney. You can learn these things and you can apply it. There's a whole slew of, of options and alternatives that you can use just because you learn how to learn. And so that's what I would leave you guys with. Education is not some, some RTA thing that you learn in a book. It's about being able to transition and translate whatever you learn into that book into something that you can apply. And so that's what I would leave you with. That's how important an education really is. So it was, a, it was funny because recently there was a quote that went out on our Facebook page, and it was from me. And it talked about, in general, paraphrasing how education should not be selective, meaning that we shouldn't teach what we think we want to teach. I mean, as, as, as a person, I need all the facts, right? Give me all the facts, and then you allow me to decipher through it and figure it out for myself. And in Tennessee recently, we've seen that the education board, they wanted to strip talking about slavery, 
but keep talking about the Confederate the Confederate War, which I don't know how you talk about slavery um, without talking about the Confederate War. Um, it should should education be selective? Like, should we allow our, our young people, like even Howard? Howard recently has stripped um, a lesson from there, and um, Cornell West wrote a beautiful article saying, listen, it's our job as educators to give them all the data and give them all the information and let them make a choice. Should education be selective? Um, anybody can jump in on that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that we haven't touched upon is for those people that actually like to use their hands and that are interested mm-hmm. in working in the trades. Because we know that traditional education, some people are not wanting to go to college. And I think everybody on the call, including myself, did. However, what I'm here to represent today is that through labor, we have opportunities at no cost that are four-year apprenticeship programs that could be in plumbing that can be an electrical training program, that can be a theatrical lighting person. Plumbing, electric, all of the things are mill right. The average wage for those folks is over $50,000 a year, and that is at the start. We have free training, and anyone on the call, I put my email address in the chat. Contact me if you are a youth. 18 years or older, in some cases 17, and you're interested in being trained, you have to put in the time. But if you're interested in the training, I can help you with that with no debt at the end of the track. Let it be known. Yes, yes. I love it. Please contact me because what we're doing is operating engineers. When folks drive down the road, we still be. Those men and women make tons of money. CDL drivers, they make money. So many times we found that our children so dropped to get school, and if they're not going on to a graduate degree, then they spend more time paying back the loan that they got for that four-year degree. What I'm saying is apprenticeship programs that I represent don't have that. They are with unions. So please feel free to contact me. Um, the last thing, and I'm sorry that I have to depart the call early, you're about to talk about CRT. I was at a Cherokee County School District meeting on Thursday night. It was appalling, the responses to this. Two nights before that in in uh, Forsyth County, Daniel Blackman was on the news. You may have seen him talking about, he's a person that's very active in our community about the need to teach. It's, it's not making anybody a villain and somebody else a victim, but it's the right for people to learn. Right. So I know about what you were about to talk about with selective learning. I just wanted to put that out there about the education piece because we didn't touch upon non-college education that can actually earn you a, a living wage and a career path for the future. Oh, so I, I thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, I know you're in California. No, I know you're in California enjoying your family. So thank you for even being a part of this today. And thank you for coming on at such a last minute. Oh, last day, June 11th. We will have a job here from 10 to 2. I encourage everyone to come. It will be at 510 William Street. We are partnering with a number of agencies, including MARTA, including the Urban League. Um, And a public school. The, the adult education program. So we have many people that will be there. Um, if you heard a live nation, particularly for a lot of young folks on the call, they go to concerts, they know about stage and lighting and all those training opportunities. We will have them available. So please encourage folks to come June 11th, which is a Friday, 10 to 2, 510 William Street at the FEW Auditorium. Again, any questions about that, contact Sean Smith or contact me via email, and we will get all the information to you and a flyer. Absolutely, and we're going to actually have it on our website at the end of the day as well. I mean, by, by Monday, by the end of the day, Monday, we'll have it on our website as well. Um, and we'll make sure this information get put out on Facebook too. No, you're so welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to jump back into this. So um, Colonel Hunton, right? I wanted to bring you back into this part of the conversation because I know that we were just talking the other day when I met with you about 
the need for officers in Paulding County, right? And, I, and I'm speaking from Paulding County because that's where you work, but I think I've heard this from like across the state that a lot of law enforcement agencies are having a hard time um, hiring and bringing people in or looking for people. And you guys are looking for people. So tell what, like, and if I wanted to become an officer, what are some of the steps I need to take? Well, uh, first of all, we have a uh, pre-screening uh, process that you go through. It's just a questionnaire. And it just asks you basic questions. Um, it goes into drug use, uh, uh, legal issues, things of that nature. If you've ever been arrested, things things like that. And then from there, uh, you'll come in. We do a physical assessment, which is just a obstacle course. Um, which recently, um, Georgia Post Council has put in place uh, an actual physical obstacle course that you have to pass in order to go to the police academy. So we've been doing it for a little while ourselves, um, but now it's part of the state mandate through our post council. Um, once you complete the physical assessment, there's an oil interim, and then there's a background uh, that takes place, polygraph, psychological, medical screening, uh, drug tests, things of that nature. Um, and then we try to get you to work um, and try to educate everybody as quickly as we can. We have a uh, within our detention facility, we have a jail training program that's eight weeks long, and you're assigned with a jail training officer, and they show you everything to do on your daily duties and everything. Uh, teach you how to communicate, um, for, you know, especially, I'm not being ugly, but our younger generation, they, they're all on these cell phones, and uh, they, uh, they can text and type real good, but really trying to get them to communicate. Um, and then uh, uh, from there, there's all kinds of obstacles. There's, uh, uh, we have multiple divisions. Um, you know, we're a full service sheriff's office in Paulding, so we cover it all. So. And that's important. I think that most time people think about working for the police force. They think about being on the street, a police officer, but there are other jobs besides being a police yeah. officer in, in the county, right? Oh, yeah. We have court security. Um, we have a uh, warrants civil division. Civil is mainly dealing with civil papers. Uh, since the sheriff is a constitutional office, we have to uphold the uh, orders that come down from uh, the superior court and things of that nature, and also <laughs> magistrates. So <clears throat> we may have, uh, you know, uh, civil action, uh, five phase, uh, garnishments, things like that. We, we do all kinds of things. Um, I've got a, I've got a, um, I've, on our patrol division. I've got guys that work the Silver Comet Trail. Um, for those that aren't familiar with it, it runs all the way from Atlanta to Alabama. Mm -hmm. It's an old railroad uh, railway, and they turned it into a uh, recreational walking and biking and running trail. And we have about uh, 23 to 26 miles that come through our county alone. And I have guys, that's all they do. They, they work the trail. Um, you know, helping people with flat tires, getting them back to their cars, getting them water. It's, it's a good thing, um, and also, you know, they're there to protect it as well um, <clears throat> from any bad elements that are out there. So we got, we do all kinds of things. Um, I did want to throw in there, we're having a job fair on June 24th, and it's going to be at our uh, Board of Commissioners building, which is right there off of 278. But uh, if you go to Paulding.gov, they have the information posted there as far as the hours and all. And that's not just for the Sheriff's Office, it's for the entire county. Because we have other positions available in different as well. So also, Judge Angela Brown, I'm going to bring you back into this, too, because just because everybody thinks that, you know, there's more to you, right? I mean, I was in your office the other day, well, not the other day, you know, a couple of months ago, but there's more pieces than just being a judge. Like, you have a, somebody who works with you, somebody, a legal assistant, you know, there's more to the, to the judge's chamber than just the judge that comes out, right? Um, explain to them like the different positions that you guys have. Like it's just not I me. Mean, if you came, if you're not going to be the judge, there's other things that you can do within the judges' chambers, right? Uh, the employees that work with you. Yes, ma'am. Within the court system. Within the court system and employees that work with you. So I mean, I think that's the beauty of the legal system itself. Uh, let me answer that first question. Within with the judge. Um, you're right, people see me and they never see the hard work of people behind me. Uh, so for me to come out on time, 
I have a judicial assistant who works um, and coordinates with the security, coordinates with the clerk's office, coordinates with the attorneys to make sure that everybody is where they're supposed to be. Um, we have a dedicated clerk from the clerk's office who makes sure that all the files are in place, um, that notices go out to people so that they can um, know that they have to come to court this day or, and it will come to court another day. Um, I have a staff attorney, so I actually have an attorney um, so that, you know, if legal issues come up, um, I'll go to the staff attorney and say, okay, this motion came in, what is, look at every, look at the law, you come and talk to me, um, like having your own attorney, you open the door, and you say, I don't understand this law, what does it mean, or well, here's the two sides, what do you think, and then she gives the law to me, and then I read it and make a decision. Um, and then the hardest working person, um, I have a uh, court reporter, that every time I'm on the bench, she's on the bench. Um, and when I'm not on the bench and I'm out having lunch and having fun, she is in her office trying to get transcripts ready for um, attorneys. I, I think Ms. Connor probably works, if I work 20 hours, Ms. Connor works 35 to 40 hours for every 20 hours that I work. And I can't do anything without her being there because the record is kept. But then we have all sorts of people. We have um, um, people who work for the county who come through and clean and disinfect the offices, right? My office, every morning I come in, the office is super clean. But it takes someone who has to go in there and disinfect. Um, and they, and she, Ms. Sandra does it all. She makes sure that everything is up to CDC standards. Um, we have people who come in and, and fix the lights and make sure the electricity is working. Um, and there's just so many different people that have to work together so that when I come out, it looks like it's all me, but it's really the people behind me. Um, which is a note to every youth out there, you need to be nice to everybody you come in contact with <laughs> in a place because you never know you know, who might be there, who's helpful, and who knows everything. When I want to know what's going on, I can ask the deputy because they see everything. And they talk to everybody, and they'll stand there and look around and check, but they hear everything. And then I talk to Ms. Sandra. I talk to the people who uh, do the cleaning and the courtroom cleanup because they hear everything. Um, and then that's just with the one courtroom. Right? So you have 10 courtrooms that are just like that. Um, and then within the county, you have so many different people in accounting, in human resources who take care of uh, hiring and what people need to get hired. You've got, um, we have an IT computer person, because I'm bad with computers. Um, <laughs> like I said, my son came in and put the background up for me. But we have a we have computer people who you never see um, unless there's a problem and then they come out of nowhere. We call him Superman Clark Kent because he will come out of nowhere in two seconds, fix everything, and then he disappears again. Um, but there's just so many different pieces that have to interlock so that we can work well. And Vice Chair Natalie Hall, I wanted to bring you in on this part too because, like, I did a podcast show with her this week. And I was amazed at the amount of people that was just involved in, in the detail of it. I was like, oh, my God, I need to step up my game. Um, <laughs> you guys were amazing. But even from that perspective, there's, there's a lot of people that help you and put, help make you who you are, right? Um, let's tell some of you about those job opportunities as well. Um, so as a Fulton County Commissioner, we have a budget, an office budget, which allows us to hire staff and based on a, a law that was passed, we can have four full-time staff or we can have three full-times and two part-time staff. And so I currently have a director of legislative and community affairs. This is uh, someone who has been with me since my very first campaign. Um, she is a leader. Uh, for me, I'm not about degrees because um, degrees don't make the person a good employee. It is the employee that makes them a good employee. And so um, so I don't require degrees. I require something that's totally different. 
when I build my team, I build my team based on those areas where I know there's a need that I could not do because there's something else that I need to do in my position. And so I covered by hiring someone that can fill that need, such as uh, my leg my director of legislative and community affairs, she will read in my mind. And I get so much legislation that has to be read. Some of this legislation is, you know, could be pages and pages of, um, of reading that could take hours and, and days. And so she helps me read the legislation so that I know what I'm going to be voting on when I have to vote at those board of commissioners meetings every first and third Wednesday of the month. And um, she also is a thinker like me. She thinks deeper into what is going on. She is a researcher like me. So I needed that assistance, and that's what I'm looking from the, in, in for a person to fill that position. I didn't look at a degree because a degree is not going to make you a person that reads. A degree is not going to make you a person that comprehends well and that knows how to how to look at something and say, okay, I need to know more information to, to really understand what this is and what this is going to do to the people in this district. And my other position is um, my district director, who is someone who has been in the political arena for some years, who has experience through the, working for the late city council member in Atlanta, Ivy the Young Jr., and who has worked for Atlanta City Council Member Peter Winslow, has worked community wide as a consultant and contractor for John Pope Bryant at his Promise Home um, nonprofit organization, which is affordable housing. And he also works with Mr. Thomas W. George Jr., who is one of the black men and just brothers. And so that, that um, experience that he has is what drew me to him and hiring him as part of my team because he not only has experience working for an elected official, but he also has community experience and housing for affordable uh, housing for families and housing for the homeless is very important to me. That's something that I've been trying to do for a couple of years. And so his background is what drew me. Education wise, all of the education, um, I would say when looking for um, education, do what you love. Don't just do something because it's popular for the moment, because it will be popular for that moment, and then next thing you know, there will be something else that's more popular to have a degree in. So do what you love. When you do what you love, you're going to, number one, do the best job ever. You're never going to get tired of doing it. Like mm -hmm. people say to me and my team that what we do is hard work, and I tell them it's not hard work, it's heart work. It comes from our heart. We do, it flows out of us. It's a lifestyle, it's not a job. You don't punch in from nine to five. You live it every single day, every hour of the day, because serving it is a lifestyle. And I want to shift a little bit. So one of the things that, <clears throat> interestingly enough, I was in Dallas last week. And I spoke to a group of like 25 nonprofits. It's supposed to be just them, but it ended up being like 500 people there. And there was a group of about 20 men that came to meet, 20 young men, 20 young African-American men. They were under, all under age of 18. And one of the questions they had, and I'm going to bring Attorney Griggs into it, is what do I do like when I'm dealing with law enforcement? Like, how do I interact? Like, what is that I need to do? Because we've seen a video recently, right? And I know all of us have seen it of a, of a I think he was a lieutenant in the Army. And the police officers wanted him to get out of the car. And they treated the man literally like a dog, maced him. And while he was literally had his hands out and said, I'm scared, what should I do? I mean, complying with all the rules. And the police officer looked at him and said, you should be scared, and maced him again. Um, so those, and we just seen something happen in Louisiana where we just seen video of a guy who was, um, who was killed literally by the police, but they said that, you know, he ran into a tree. And evidence has proved that that's, that was not the case, right? Um, Attorney Griggs, how how do we make sure we get home at night? That's a good question. And um, first and foremost, I want to start off by saying, um, you know, I, I do this kind of law, and in this kind of law, there are uh, feelings on both sides. And what I would like for our young men to understand 
is that even though we see these viral videos, and I see them every single day, um, that we have to remember uh, that these represent maybe 2 to 3% of the interactions that happen with law enforcement. Um, so, you know, as somebody that grew up with uh, members of law enforcement in my family and as an officer of the court, I respect the law. Right. I respect the administration of justice, and I respect uh, officers who carry out uh, the protection of the Constitution. That being said, uh, there is a very disturbing trend that's happening right now with the lack of accountability by certain members of law enforcement. And I think that's where we have to fully educate our citizenry on what their rights really are. Um, you know, you have a Fourth Amendment right against unlawful and unreasonable searches and seizures, and you have a Fifth Amendment right uh, for counsel and the, the ability to remain silent and not have uh, any statements you may turn uh, used against you. With all of that said, there are seminal cases in Georgia, there are seminal cases uh, around the country. Uh, Terry versus Ohio, Miranda versus Arizona, and, and Georgia Van Zandt versus the state that kind of tells you what the rules are with regard to uh, engagement with law enforcement. You know, there are, there are three levels of a stop. There's a consensual stop, uh, there's a reasonable detention, and then there's an arrest. And so when we, we watch these traffic stops, they are literally going from consensual stop all the way up to arrest very quickly, and there are certain rules of engagement that happen all the way through. So if you're stopped by law enforcement, this is my advice as Gerald Briggs, the lawyer. Now I'm going to give you my advice as Gerald Briggs, the black man. Gerald Briggs, the lawyer, you stop by law enforcement. At that point, it's typically a consensual stop. If you stop and you consent, they're going to come to your car, they're going to ask for your license and probably some form of uh, uh, insurance or registration. Typically, they had all, all that in the computer, but they still might ask you. You have to give them your license. You give them your license, and you ask them, am I being detained? They will tell you whether or not you're being detained. That's probably all constitution you have to do at that point. You don't have to give them all the story about where you're coming from and all that stuff. All you got to do is give them your license. Um, they gonna run your license if you have warrants. If they have problems, I mean, they have reasonable suspicion to suspect you of something. They may ask you to get out the car. You, you should get out of the car. Okay. Everything else, I would not have any statements. Uh, I would ask if I'm free to go. If I'm not free to go, I'd ask for my attorney. That's how I would handle all that. And of course, I'd be recording all of it on my phone. Now, that's that's basically the law. Now let's go to survival mm -hmm. as Gerald Reeves, the black man. If law enforcement encounters you, whether it's a consensual stop or, you know, they, they want to detain you, they want to search you, they want to do all of these things, cut on your cell phone and start recording. Listen to what the person is saying to you and try as best you can without losing your constitutional rights to survive the encounter. Because right now, there seems to be a lack of understanding of how people's constitutional rights should be dealt with with these traffic stops that are turning dead. Uh, there used to be, we used to give you a whole list of rules of what you should and shouldn't do. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Don't make any permanent moves. Don't, don't, do, just don't do any of that. Cut on record and try to survive. Because I can tell you, if you are compliant, you know, you will survive. That's not true. Philando was compliant. He didn't survive. I can tell you, uh, you can try to have a conversation with them on the side of the road. That's not true. Officer Sterling, he didn't survive. So, you know, I can give you examples of so many different encounters. So the best thing I would say at this point is record and try your very best Listen to what the police officer is saying and maintain your constitutional rights, but also survive the encounter. Hopefully, in the next two weeks or so, there will be some guidance from 
the President of the United States and Congress on how we deal with these things called the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act or some sort of executive order. But currently, right now, as an attorney and also as a black man, I'm not going to lie to my black brothers and sisters. There is cause to be concerned. What happened to the veteran up in, in uh, Virginia, what happened to uh, Andrew Brown in North Carolina, what happened two years ago in Louisiana, what has happened here in Atlanta, multiple occasions, there are reasons to be concerned. And my hope is that members of the legislative branch will figure out a way to create actually a set of standards on how we um, deal with these issues because we understand that policing is a very difficult job but also there has to be some amount of concern for certain groups of citizens it is it is unnecessary to have a thousand u.s citizens a year killed by law enforcement that's a statistic from the washington post from 2015 to now, every single year, there are a thousand individuals that are killed by law enforcement. That we should never have to keep track of the number of people killed. So, my best advice at this point to Cord and try as best as you can to maintain your constitutional rights. Also, also survive the encounter. And I'm going to bring in DA Patsy Austin Gatson because I mean, they also need to know how to behave in the courtroom per se, right? Um, a lot of people, when they get to court, the very, definitely first appearance or whatever you call it here in Georgia, they want to try to um, argue their point there, right? And that's not the place for them to do so. And I think that you need to know that um, not the best place, right? Guilty or not guilty too. Uh, once someone is arrested, they get to come for the court. And um, be a preliminary hearing they're just not looking at guilt or innocence they're just looking at probable cause for the arrest um, and I think you know it's just, just like attorney Griggs indicated ask for your lawyer you shouldn't be making a lot of comments um, that might go against you once the trial comes up so that is your constitutional right to have an, an attorney in our cases, uh, we do have court-appointed attorneys if a person cannot afford one. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the early question that you asked about the different um, areas where people can work in the DA's office. Uh, we have investigators, uh, we have uh, chief investigators, and we have a deputy investigator, we have victim witness advocates, we have administrative professionals, and it takes a whole team uh, to keep an office going. We have about 150 employees right now. And um, it, it takes all of us. It takes all of us to work and push that forward. And uh, I would agree with what Attorney Griggs indicated. Get home alive. That's the most important thing. And it's hard to tell people how you interact with, 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 with police. But, you know, we all deserve dignity and respect. Right. You know, we have to give that dignity and respect to the officers, and they owe it to us as citizens because they're there to protect and serve. Unfortunately, a lot of things have happened that have that has gone viral. And when a person loses their child, that's one of the worst things anyone can ever go through. And in the violent ways that we have seen happen. And I'm just hopeful, too, that something will come out of D.C. that will help help us manage this and uh, it's a lot of gun violence june is a uh, gun uh, national gun awareness and we have to start thinking outside of the box so that we can even stop a lot of the gun violence that's going on in our cities and in our towns and in the country it's just everywhere it's like biden said there's an epidemic of gun violence and it's embarrassing that our country is at this stage now, but we have to all try to do something. So somebody actually posted on our Facebook chat. They said lack of accountability is the problem. It needs to be addressed. Would you guys agree that lack of accountability is a problem in the justice system? Well, we see what happened in Arkansas. Where the video was 
was not let 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 out. I think people need to it needs to be more transparency. And that's gonna bring accountability. It's like attorney Rick said, recordings, now that we have a lot of body wear camera and things like that, people can see what happened, not just what somebody reports, but seeing what happened, I think is critical. I think a lot of our young people need to understand that if you come in contact with the criminal justice system, you need a lawyer, okay? Don't come into court without a lawyer. I don't think it's just a, if it's just a misdemeanor and you feel like, well, I can handle that. What do you do and how do you make your decisions um, impacts the rest of your life? And you need someone who understands where you are. Like, I don't, I don't know, right? Going And staying, staying, and not knowing how to talk at all. So everybody's talking, everybody. I have no idea what's going on. I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure it out. I mean, all the time, there's so much on the world, so much on the world, and they feel like they can handle it. They're like, they can handle it. It's just a little drug charge. It's a little drug charge. And they don't realize, and they don't realize how. Um, the other side, the other side, um, first in the law, first in the law, um, free, um, free, you know, um, advantage against them, which is they enter into something, and I see them, you know, still with me, you know, six, seven years from now, you probably get that off your record, when you probably wouldn't have gone on your record to begin with. So, even if you feel like it's, it's, it's way too much money, I don't need to spend it, you need to spend it. Um, I, I cannot stress. You've got to have a lawyer, um, whatever it is, whether it's criminal law, family law, contract, something happened at work, you need to have an attorney. Attorney Griggs, I, I know you was you was trying to chime in on that too. Yeah, I definitely I agree with the judge. And here's the thing that you always should remember when you go to court. Uh, I've never been in a court situation where the state of Georgia was not represented by an attorney. So the state of Georgia thinks it's important to always have an advocate that's versed in the law there to represent their interests. The average citizen should always have an attorney there versed in the law to make sure that their interest uh, is protected. Uh, and to answer the question from the Facebook comment, yes, I do believe that accountability uh, is important and that's what's necessary to get us to the point where we can uh, move forward as a community around these things. You know, everybody wants to feel safe. Everybody wants public safety. And I think that how we reimagine public safety starts with accountability. You know, I, I would be remiss in my duties as an officer of the court if, if I didn't say um, that you know, the law, there should be two justice systems. Right. We, all saw, we all are seeing the videos. And the videos are quite clear. And, and so I think that to build the trust that is necessary in the community, many members of the system need to come to grips with there should not be two justice systems, one for uh, citizens and another for law enforcement. Right. So I, I do believe that's, that's key. But I also want the citizens to understand, as an officer of the court, I still believe that a vast majority of um, the officers of the court are protecting and defending the Constitution. Right. And we have to hold accountable the ones that are not. And I agree with you. You know, um, I, one of the things I love so much about Colonel Hunting is that literally I was in Paulton County and me and my ignorance, I ran out of gas and a, a Paulton County Sheriff's officer pulls up right next to me. Um, and they literally were like, okay, you, there's a gas station like one mile up the road. I was like, you can't give me no ride. You know, I can't walk no one mile. And he was like, oh, I'm not supposed to, but I will. And right when I got in his car for him to give me a ride to go get gas, who calls me? Colonel Hunton. And when he heard me on the phone with Colonel Hunton, he kind of like, oh, oh, how does he know Colonel Hunton kind of deal? But it was just, once again, that interaction, right? I've interacted with police officers in Cherokee County before who literally um, at two o'clock in the morning pulled out a gun on me because he asked me what was in the bag and I went reaching for the bag, not even thinking. And at the end of it, I, I followed the rules, <laughs> stepped with it, kept with it, right? And we had a 30 minute conversation about gun rights and all this other kind of stuff. So it's ways that we can shift focus. And I, I do believe that 
we don't argue our case on the street. <laughs> that's why we have superior court judges like in, um, Judge Brown. Um, that's that's their job. But you always got to make sure you have some kind of representation. And I think that even Colonel Hutton would agree with that. But um, Pastor Lisa, I mean, I know you're passionate about this because we were in a meeting earlier this week with somebody from Senator Warnock's team. And you brought up a lot of things about um, social injustice and the, the, the system and how it works. Go ahead. Are you muted out on us? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Um, as Attorney Greg, he just laid it out all out perfectly, but as we said, it was so clear that there are two justices for the county. He said about black person, and your name, Sean, is trying to um, bring things to where everybody is, um, the system works the same way for all people. And I wanted to point out if it's all right with you, Sean, that you're actually, you and Black Push are actually working on um, a Fair Justice Act for the state of Georgia to um, overhaul the criminal justice system from the top to the bottom. One of the things that's not fair as it is right now, um, and this I learned from you, Sean, is that um, it, when, well, part of the Fair Justice Act, um, of course, wants to do away with the whole um, grand jury indictment thing. And um, as it is right now, if a regular person, um, you know, their case goes before the grand jury, and um, I stand corrected because we're all these legal geniuses here on the panel. I mean, <laughs> you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, like if I, if I have a case that went before the grand jury, um, you know, all the evidence that is against me is presented, and then they determine if there's enough probable cause or whatever to proceed with the case. But if I understand it correctly, if a police officer goes, if they uh, have a, a case or something to go before the grand jury, somebody or something is also presented on their behalf. And that's, um, that's something that's not afforded to a regular citizen. I don't know if that falls under diplomatic immunity or whatever kind of immunity that they're under because of their um, office, but seeing some of those protections that aren't fair, um, that aren't, aren't right, <laughs> that don't apply to everybody else, seeing some of those um, scripts you know, reevaluated, I think is really important because it, it couldn't be clearer. And to just sit here and listen to Attorney Griggs, a, a black man saying, you know, advising all the youth across Georgia that are watching this, and his advice, you know, as a professional and as a human being, is, you know, just survive the stop. I mean, that should be heartbreaking. And anybody who thinks, you know, that there's not a problem with racism, you know, that people like that would just stop and hear the voices that are affected and hear the hearts. I mean, this man is, you know, he's a professional. He's a, it wouldn't matter if he was or not, but, you know, he has the voices that I personally hear so much of, Sean. And, um, you know, to, to just continue, like, you always use the example, I believe, of Mr. Scott, who, um, <laughs> who claims that there's not a problem with racism in the United States of America, but, you know, to people like that, they would just pause and listen. And I saw that video of the um, Army Lieutenant, if I'm getting his title right, in Virginia, he was, I saw that video, and it was, yes, he was an Army Lieutenant, but he was also an unarmed black man, you know, at a traffic stop, just fearing for his life, hands up, just fearing, just fearing for his life, and they Right. This is a very, very passionate thing for me because um, we just don't have the democracy to see the, the problem is to see anybody who has half a heart or just a tiny bit of um, compassion in them would do, you know, of course, coming um, from the religious perspective, you know, you can't, you cannot really claim to be, in my case, a Christian and then see somebody in the ditch over here suffering and dying dying and your death and just be okay with walking by and turning a turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to their suffering it's just not possible if you have you know just any kind of compassion at all just even just basic human dignity just everybody's right to live for Christ. so um anyhow you you and i have talked about this forever we can go on forever but i'll just stop now um <laughs> so we don't just continue endlessly in this but it's a big problem and I hope that people who are watching this will share this. And so, you know, like you spoke to, like everybody on the panel has spoke to, is so real. 
just as real life that I really just will share the study. I think I'm going to do this one more learning. Just what do you do as a traffic stop and study here? It's straight from um, Attorney Gritty. It's, a, it's, it's powerful and it's, it's literally getting this information out could literally be a matter of life and death for somebody. So I just encourage everyone to share this far and wide so we can get this information to as many of you and as many people as possible so people can hear the real things that are going on. And I have to ask this question. Um, so we got a question through Facebook, and I, I'm, I'm non-biased. So I'm going to ask whatever the question is. I'm going to read it exactly what they wrote. It says, why is it that most white officers are so aggressive to people of color? I don't see that when black officers, it's always the white ones killing the blacks. I don't see it the other way around. Maybe I'm wrong, but what most of the videos show, is it different training for these officers? And I think Colonel Hunton, if I'm going to throw that at you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so inspirational.
So we're going to shift around here. I want to talk about, um, unless somebody else has something they want to throw in there, because I look like Attorney Griggs at one point was going to jump in there. Yeah, I just wanted to hop in and I completely uh, appreciate uh, what Deputy just said. Um, but just to talk about what the commenter said, I would be being disingenuous if I was to say it's only white officers that are doing this, uh, because I've seen too many videos uh, for all over the country, but particularly from Atlanta and in Georgia, uh, where it's black officers, it's, it's Latino officers, it's Asian officers, as well as white officers. And again, I, I want to preface this by saying that these issues can be addressed by having accountability for the officers that violate the public trust. And I think that's where the conversation needs to go. You know, it needs to go into a, a, a system that is equipped to deal with this. You know, every single day, there are a couple of people on this call that we deal with the criminal justice system every single day. And the problem is enough of these cases are not making it to a jury because we have individuals that, you know, don't have the courage to do what's right. right. So what I, what I mean by that is, and again, this is not to, to directly to anybody on the call, but there, you know, I feel the criminal law every single day. Okay, I know you can indict a ham sandwich. Sometimes <laughs> it, don't, it doesn't even need to have to be a sandwich with some bread. You can indict that. But when it comes to law enforcement officers, they find every single trick in the book to justify not indicting this individual so that a jury of 12 can look at all of the evidence. And I agree with the deputy. Most of the time in these videos, we see a clip. It's a clip of what happened. And so people are forming their opinions. But like in George Floyd, we got to see it all because it was put in front of a jury. And I think we can get back to where we need to be as a country if multiple officers are put on trial for these killings. You know, if if uh, if Ray Shard and and and, uh, and De Dewante murder somebody, they get arrested, no bond, and they're going to have a trial. But if if Officer uh, uh, kills somebody, we're going to have the GBI step in. They're going to investigate for some inordinate amount of time. Then it's going to be turned over to a district attorney, and they're going to sit on the case for a little while. <laughs> and that just causes the tension. The tension is the country is continuing to see black lives bodies in the street over and over and over again and we're not seeing any justice. So, again, Washington needs to do something and they need to do it right now because, you know, the, the case we just saw in Louisiana, two years, that video set bodies on campus. The body on campus are for the protection of law enforcement as well as the citizens. Right. Why are we sitting on these campus? Why are we not putting it out? Why are we not putting it in front of a grand jury? And so I think that's a conversation that legal professionals need to have with our legislators. You can you can support law enforcement all day long. I support good law enforcement by holding them to the same standard as any citizen is held to. And I think that's a solution that needs to happen. And that's crazy because on that part, everybody on the panel literally shook their head, yes. Everybody. Because we all <laughs> I think we all can agree to that, that that um that that the law should not be blind, right? That that it should be I mean if we're gonna have laws and we're gonna have standards for citizens, then definitely those who are put in the place um of helping to distribute that law should definitely be held accountable to the law. Um, and that's that's everybody. I mean, uh, thinking Paul and Cal well, I'm not gonna throw show you at Paul and County. You guys just had the incident there with your DA. I mean, everybody's responsible, right? Um, and everybody should be held accountable, no matter who you are. And if if they can do it to a DA, they should be able to do it to a police officer, right? Or even a judge if they're out of misconduct. No shade. But if a judge is not doing what they need to do, um, one of the things that I really want to shift to is it's really important to me is voting, right? Voting, 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 voting. 
Um, one of the things that I love about Colonel Hunt, and we had this conversation the other day about like, you know, in Atlanta, and we get to use Atlanta, Georgia as an example, right? I stay in Cobb County. In Cobb County, we have Cobb County Police Department, Cobb County Sheriff's Office. We have, um, our still has a police department. Palace Springs has a police department. All these people have a police department. And Colonel Hunt brought up a very valid point to me the other day. He said that the only person, as far as when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to officers who is appointed by the people and held accountable by the people is the sheriff's department. I mean, the other, I mean, police chiefs, they're nominated by the commission board. They're put up there by the commission board. The only elected official in the county that is in law enforcement, per se, in the police aspect of it, that is that is voted in is the sheriff. But we have to understand that um, we have to start voting our interests, right? We can't complain about something when we don't get out and vote. And Georgia um, did that this year. But uh, I'm going to start with Vice Chair Woman, um, Natalie Hall. Why? It's important to vote, right? Absolutely. Because he has already shown his commitment to the community across all of Fulton County. And we have a saying, hashtag one Fulton, because we embrace every, every municipality that lies inside of the Fulton County boundaries, every city. Um, Fulton County, um, we need our, um, our sheriffs. We need our, we also have a police department, um, which unfortunately is uh, diminishing because our county police department was um, supposed to be law enforcement across the um, unincorporated portion of Fulton County. And since recently, the governor signed legislation that has given a portion of that area to the city of South Fulton and then another portion to the city of Atlanta, we now are down to, I think it's one mile or less of unincorporated Fulton County. And so uh, our police department is shrinking. But we do have police departments in those municipalities that will take over the law enforcement. So it's, it's very important. Did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Judge Angela Brown, you didn't get to the bench by somebody appointing you there, right? Or some hypothetically, let's use that right. Somebody did appoint you there. So I, I love hearing your story uh, because you beat out, not throwing no shades anyone in particular, but you beat out <laughs> somebody who had been there and they were their, the, the chief judge of Superior Court, right? That's correct. And, but you're voted in, correct? to understand that it's good to have people and good people who have uh, views of this and views of that, but a lot of our systems, including the justice system, including the policing system, are systems that have been around since the colonial times of America, right? And so they are systems that have incorporated racism and the oppression of, of one set of people over another. And this has gone through history after history after history. It's good to know your history because if you can see where we have come from, you can understand why we are where we are right now. You, you must understand there are great people. You can put a great person. Um, one great person cannot change in, in an institutionalized system. And so in order to change these systems that we have now in place, you have got to put people in who have different visions and different um, backgrounds and different diversities of thought into these systems to change the system. You can't change the system from the inside. You have got to take people from the outside, from the corners of the very outside portions of community and society and place them in the power, right? And that's the only way to do that, I tell people, is to vote. To vote for someone um, or to run yourself. If you qualify to run for a position, put your name in the hat and run for it because that's how we change the system, by putting someone in who is not, you know, born and bred of that same system. Um, if you feel the system is oppressive, 
then not only do you vote, but you get behind someone whose views are, are the same as your views. Um, you don't like what the sheriff is doing, then vote another sheriff in, right? Because that's how, that's the power. Um, and I know it is really important to show solidarity, but in the end, you have got to translate that into voting power. Right. Um, my, my father, I know many of you know, especially the airmen, uh, my father has told us that every time the voting booth opens, we need to take advantage of that vote because someone died and went through hell to be it for you to have a vote, right? For women to have a vote. For people of color to have a vote. Um, we can be heard. And, and I, I see it in my own story. Carl County has never had a person of color on a superior court. We've never had a black, we've never had a Latina, we've never had uh, Asian. It has been basically a white male dominated um, bench, right? And there are some good people on the bench, but there is there has been predominantly one view of how things should be done. And so we got out there and now, you know, now we have two African uh, African American females. I, I'm proud that share that title, the first African-American Superior Court judge with Judge Kelly Hill, because we got out and told people we have got to make a change, um, and this is the way we do it. And we didn't do it by ourselves. We did it by ordinary Joe Blow standing in line for 14 hours just to say, you know what, Judge, I, I hear what you're saying. I feel like you could do something in the justice system. Even if you don't do anything, I just feel like you're going to look at it a little differently. And so here's my vote. We have to get out there. They've, they've changed the parameters of the voting game. Doesn't matter. You still get out there. If it right. takes 27 hours for me to vote, I will stand out there and I'm going to have my voice heard. Because we can have conversations like this all day long. I can talk to Gerald Ray every single day and be empowered. Yeah, that's a good idea. But I've got to translate that into the vote. Get out. Register to vote. Get out and vote. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't vote or you shouldn't vote or you're not qualified to vote or your vote doesn't matter because it does matter. And I would say this too, um, before I go over to DA Patsy, um, that even those who are getting purged from the voting from the, from the voting voting rolls, fight for that but right. I mean, if you know that you have the right to vote, and I, my mom, true story, my mom voted in 2008 for um, the presidential election. 2012 came around, and they told her that she was ineligible eligible to vote. Keep in mind, she had not been in, incarcerated or any kind of law enforcement issues for over 40 years, <laughs> and they told her that she was ineligible to vote. A week after that, they sent her a letter and said, oh, we made a mistake. You should have been had the right to vote. So, I mean, we have to fight for it. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. And when they do tell you that you can't do it, find attorney Gerald Grizz. I'm pretty sure he'll he'll come and help you make sure mm -hmm. that, that right is restored. Um, DA Patsy Austin Gaston, but they need to know, too, your position is an elected position. Oh, it's, it's hard to walk. So, I ran as a Democrat in the primary. Uh, I had a challenge there. Also, when the general election came around, I had the incumbent to challenge that had been in office for 28 years. So it was a very, uh, very interesting campaign. And just like uh, Judge Brown said, you get out there, you talk to people, you encourage them to go vote. And I believe what she has said is very important, too. No matter how long it takes, we will be there voting. Bring your own water. <laughs> you know, whatever you have to do, bring a chair. But we have to be there. So I really do believe that people are more woke now than ever, and we will not sit back and let that vote be taken, ever. And I think it's important for people to vote early. In case, like you said about your mom having that problem, she got to the polls. So if, she, if we will vote early, if there's a problem, then we can reach out and have those things fixed. And I love what Stacey Abrams did in our state, and I love what... Um, Democratic Party has done in our state where we had voter hotlines all day long when it was time to vote, people were like, are there any problems? And folks were able to call in and have things adjusted and dealt with on the spot. So it's very important that we 
keep that up. I had family calling me from New Jersey when the senators were, were running. Is Georgia going to do it? I said, Georgia's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, that we will continue to push forward. And um, I think it's not it's not really about party as much as it is about us keeping our democracy. Right. We have to work hard to keep our democracy. And it's like everyone has said, people have died for our, our right to vote. And I hope that the um, John Lewis um, voting bill is also passed so that people will know that um, that time is now. Time is always now. And if we want our, our families, our children to have a future, we have cannot sit on that right. We have to exercise it. Attorney Griggs, I see your hand is raised over there. And, and I just want to say this. I want to start naming some of the people that died. One in particular, Jimmy Lee Jackson, uh, was killed uh, in Alabama uh, and was one of the impetus for uh, the Voting Rights Act and the march from Selma to Montgomery, where my good brother and my friend and my mentor, uh, John Lewis, was so brutally beaten. Uh, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Young people, I need y'all to hear me. Hear me clearly. Your vote is the most important nonviolent weapon that we have. Regardless of whatever means they try to take it away, whether that's literacy test or voting currency, whether that is Jim Crow 1.0 or Jim Crow 2.0, we have an obligation to vote to make sure we hold our right, because I was the very first generation of my family. I'm going to say that again. I was the first generation of my family to be born with all of my rights. Wow. Okay. That is how important voting is. And because it's so important, and because you saw what happened in November and January, because of the work of Black women and Black organizers, and, and candidates that spoke to the people and individuals that stood in line for 14 hours. You saw something in this generation that we've never seen before. We saw an African-American senator mm -hmm. from a former slave state. He is the eighth black senator in the history of this country. You saw a young Jewish senator be elected. And you saw power shift hands. America is one of the few democracies in the world where you can have a revolution without a war. Mm. You can have the entire government changed by ballot and not a bullet. So I hear a lot of young folks talking about they revolutionaries. But do you know what a revolution really is? It's changing those that govern. This country provides for that ability by voting. And if voting was not so important, the suppressor in chief in this state would not have signed Senate Bill 202 and arrested a young Rosa Parks, who I call Park Ham. So, again, young people, you don't need to look in some far gone history to see what's going on. You can look right now and see how important elections are. You have to say, individuals on this call, many of which are the first, the DA, and Gwyneth Paltrow, they said there was no way, no way she was going to win. She's the DA. Mm -hmm. You have vice <laughs> chief, in my own life, for my own life, my own life. Any community, every time I'm in a community, she is with marches, food deliveries, something going on with Laura, something going on with Labor, she's always there. Judge Brown, Judge, I, I remember the very first election that Judge Brown ran for, she ran for state court judge when I lived in Todd County. She knocked doors, she knocked doors. This is democracy working. The sheriff over in Paul, <laughs> is actually a part of the court. But, you know, 
And so understand how this really works. It empowers you to understand how important voting is. So I want y'all to do me a favor because I can, I, I'm going to shut up after this. The <laughs> last time I saw Representative John Lewis, we were at a march. We were at, I believe it was a family for long together march. That was the march to shut down the detention camps uh, for, for ICE. Mm. He walked up to me. He said, Jim, I'm so happy to be here. And I was thinking to myself, Absolutely. And I wanted to throw um, a pastor muster in here because I, I, you know, and um, attorney, I'm sorry, not attorney, Judge Brown could probably <laughs> speak to this too, that the spiritual community plays a huge role in getting people out to vote. I mean, what are some of the things that you guys have done and some of the things you guys will continue to do um, over there in Gwinnett County? At the church house, uh, a couple of voting drives um, to register, we did what we had to do to the Board of Elections, and we actually held voting registration drives where we, um, and it was during COVID, so we had it all, you know, COVID protocol and everything. People could drive through, didn't have to touch anybody or anything. We had, you know, disposable pins and all that, but we literally registered people in the community um, to vote, and, and it helped them. You know, we, there's, Gwinnett County, as you all know, is so diverse now, so we had a lot of people who, who, um, had moved here from other countries and they didn't know if they even were allowed to vote. If they, they didn't know how to go about it. They didn't know if they had to live here a certain time. They just, they wanted to vote, but they, they just felt uncomfortable with the process. So a lot of times, you know, churches can be a safe place and a community for people to come with, you know, people like, like they do when people on the church grounds and talk to us about it and not get arrested for their, their, their papers or their immigration status or what have you. So, um, we had a lot of that, and um, we and then I thought it was so amazing because the the um, turnout wasn't as great as we would have wanted it to be, given all that was at stake in that election in November's election. So um, after you know the people that served all day um, in the heat and just we were probably there twelve hours just registering people, getting people signed up, answering questions, helping people, and then. At the end of the day, the people who had just sat out there all day, and you know, some of these people are seniors, and um, this is this is where young people, it's so good to involve young people. And we intentionally um, went out of our way. I know I personally recruited young people all in the name of, you know, we need somebody that can run these clipboards over to the statuses 
Mason Station and then running back to put new forms on them and, you know, just intensely, um, you know, try to pull in the youth to this in any way. And, um, but anyhow, yeah, after the first one, the, the people who had served all day came up and said, you know, the conventions are coming up, the, you know, the Republican convention and the Democratic convention. And they said, maybe people will be more, um, you know, have their passion ignited or be more on fire to come out after a convention. And so they talked us into having a second one. So we did, we did a few of those, and then, um, everybody knew that this was a place where they could come, you know, safely and without fear of being arrested or anything, and just, and also just the fact that we, we are truly international, an international church, um, that they could come here and, and we could help them um, make their voice count, because at the end of the day, that's what we said, is what, what the panel has already said, that, you know, it's a right that people died for, and every, I mean, if there's any state... <laughs> That this was true to two um, four in this last election with Georgia, where literally every vote, you know, it was up to every single vote. So um, it's important, it's really important to draw young people in. And I would just say to the young people that are watching, voting is critical. And I would challenge you to go beyond that, run for something, because we need people in office, like as Judge Brown was talking, that, you know, for there to be change, we have to put different people in. And it's never too young to start being involved in a process. You can, I don't know what age you have to be to serve on a campaign. It can even be a local campaign, a mayor campaign, or a city council person. I don't know all those details, but um, you can start just by, um, if you're interested, just become involved in some kind of way. If you can volunteer to be, you know, the leader of something at church or the leader of something, you know, in your class, or just volunteer to lead. Every chance you have an opportunity, just volunteer to lead. There's something you call, and you're, you're building yourself. You're building a um, resume, for lack of a better word. You're, you're building something. Um, just to start volunteering to lead. And then, you know, just even if you're known in your neighborhood, if you're known, you know, in your community. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. But um, I really encourage the young people to get involved in voting, absolutely. And even beyond that, just that you're passionate about or you know it could be political or whatever it is environmental and you know just get on the the board of something you can it's not too hard to get on the board of an organization you know and um and just to have a voice to be in some kind of governing position no matter what it is you're governing at a young age but start somewhere because we need you all the youth that we're speaking to is not the generation of the future you're the generation of today and we need you now to go ahead and see the 14 to 18 year olds step up to the plate now and go ahead and start getting involved wherever, however you can, because this country needs you, the community needs you, the people need you, the generations that are coming behind need you, your younger siblings, you know, all the people that are coming up, the babies that are out there now, they need you to lead them so that they'll have something um, strong, solid, powerful and right and just and fair and equal for everybody to follow. So that's my challenge to the youth on those subjects. So I want to, I mean, we're getting ready to come to time. So, you know, I'd like to stick to time. Um, <laughs> so, oh, somewhat, don't come, come for me today. We got a few technical <laughs> issues, but we got through it. Um, I just want everybody on the panel to take like a minute to kind of leave some kind of inspiration for the youth. And we'll start with Colonel Hutton and... From there, we'll go to Judge Brown, and then we'll go back to Pastor Muster, and then we'll come to DA Patsy, and then we'll go to Vice Chairwoman um, Natalie Hall, then we'll end with Gerald Grace, and then we'll have our last segment here. But I want you guys to say something to you to inspire them. So keep on pressing on. The best advice I have for our youth today is to love one another like you love yourself. And Jesus Christ directed us to do so. And treat everybody the way you want to be if we all did that, this world would be such a better place. And Sean, I want to thank you for your time. I uh, I enjoy our conversations. I enjoy our time together. I thank y'all for having me. God Absolutely. Bless. Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Judge Angela Brown. <laughs> I would just say to the students, you are our future. We, uh, we hear it all the time, but you have creator-inspired gifts, right? That there is a wave that is coming over this world that you are in the forefront of. Talk to young people, 
their ideas, their creativity, their passion. You know, don't let anybody stop you from doing what you want to do. If someone's not doing it, and, 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 and Judge Brown is not asking questions, vote Judge Brown out. Get together with your friends, right? Because you are a powerhouse by yourself. Then you add 10 of your friends, y'all become more of a powerhouse. You know, the Bible says one can fly away, what, 1,000, two can, can, can fly away 10,000. Think of what a group of y'all mm-hmm. sitting in, in, in the PlayStation room thinking of something to do, what power is behind that? There is power in your pen, there is power in your mind. All you have to do is get together and do it. Pastor Musser. We believe in you. We've all made mistakes, so you may feel like your mistakes have um, disqualified you, your background has disqualified you, but none of that's true. If you fall, just get back up. When you see the um, current situation of things, um, instead of letting it just completely depress you and get you down, let it motivate you to be part of the change. And if there's one thing I can encourage you to do, because it covers really all of this, is to serve humanity. Just to serve humanity, to be the change. I know it's, it's cliche and I have it on my wall back there, but we have to be the change, not just talk about the change, but actually be the change that we want to see in the world. So when you see a world of hate or a community of hate, you step up and be the love. When you see um, a world of injustice and inequity, you be just and fair. And like I said, I encourage you to run for whatever office you can, run for whatever kind of government you can run for at your age. But, you know, in communities that seem hopeless, um, you be the hope. Be the hope in, in, in communities, you know, where there's darkness. Be light. It's like Dr. King said, darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And um, hate can't drive out hate, but only love can drive out hate. So bring something different. Bring hope. Bring light. Bring love where there isn't any, where people don't see any. You be the hope and bring the hope. So um, we're counting on you. We need you. And um, you can start today with wherever you are. We need for you to break barriers. But just like these women have on here on the PA tent seat, who I voted for, um, but you know, break down those barriers. If somebody in your family, and you've heard several people to, um, describe how they were the first in their family, but I encourage the young people, you know, be the first in your family to break through some kind of barrier. Um, be the first one to start your own business. Be the first one to, whether you go to college or, you know, own your business. It's, it's great to have a job and work for somebody, but it's even better to work for yourself and hire people, give other people jobs. Be the first one to own your own car. Just be the first one to break out of a, um, a cycle of always being in debt or having too much debt. So there's greatness inside of you, and I just want to speak to that greatness as we close out and say it's in there, and we want to encourage you and inspire you. If there's any way, I mean, I, I think I can speak from Cal, but I'll speak for me. If there's anything I can do to encourage you, or help you along the way. My name's right there on the screen, and um, you can find me at Tabernacle International Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. And I literally will do anything I can to help anybody young break through whatever it is you're looking at, encourage, inspire you, and motivate you. I will say I'm personally there for you, and um, I believe in you. So thank you for watching. PA Patsy Austin Gaston. And you can go ahead because you already on because she the way she's on my screen is different, I think. Well, I just so much has been said today for our youth. And I think that um when I was young, one song that meant a lot to me was by Earth Wind and Fire, and it was Keep Your Head to the Sky. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think we should never give up. That's one of my things, never give up. You know, when I was in private practice, some of my clients referred to me as a bulldog. I oh. don't give up. So we just sometimes just got to push ahead through everything, every obstacle. And for some reason, God made me the kind of person that if somebody tells me I can't do something, I got something to prove. <laughs> so I just try to, you know, work hard and I encourage them to do that because if you put the effort behind it and um, you stay focused, 
that is important. Um, I'm also a big list maker. If there's something that I want to see accomplished. You find out what the process is, how you have to do it, do your research, make your list. I think somebody on the call said, I think it was um, Attorney Griggs, you all have in your hand a computer, which is your phone, and you can find out anything on any subject in the world. So I say to the young people, do your research because y'all are so excellent at it. You can find out the answer to anything and see what the process is and take those steps. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Be strong and courageous. All right, so now it's on me. Um, I have to address just a little bit of what everyone before me said because it fits into everything that I want to say to our youth. You are our future. We are aging in place. And one of the things that I hear often as a county commissioner is that the fastest growing population is the senior population. It's the aging population. And so we're going to be looking to you to be where we are and to also be the future leaders that are going to be supporting us and helping us as we age in place. If you just do a couple of things, and these are easy things, Extend love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy. These are powerful actions and emotions that can change this world. And we speak so much about the racism that we see, but we need to speak about how to combat that. And, and these are things that will combat that just by extending love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And when I was a young girl, I remember always getting challenged to do new things and to grow and learn. And I would tell my mother, but I'm scared. And she would tell me, do it scared. If it's not going to hurt you or someone else, and it's not illegal, it's not unethical, it's not harmful, do it scared. And so through that, I have learned to push forward. And I believe that that's what has brought me to this point in my life now because I don't even think about the fear anymore. I just do it. If it's right and it's the right thing to do, I do it and push right through the fear. So that's what I have to say to our youth today. Tony Griggs. First and foremost to the youth today, I want to tell you that I'm supremely proud of you. Um, you guys are a generation uh, that is ahead of your time. Uh, you are bold, you are courageous, you are inquisitive and you are already where we are but it but i usually when i give advice i would think of what i would say to a younger version of myself and i think it kind of sums up what everybody on this call has said you know with everything you do in life you're going to be a little bit afraid mm -hmm. but if you can harness that fear and turn it into focus you can achieve anything in this world period mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, you guys literally have an encyclopedia in your hand. You can learn every single thing you ever wanted to learn, either on Google or YouTube. So there's no excuse. And so what happened to my generation, I don't want to happen to yours. Don't wait. Don't wait for permission. Just do. Also, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody that's a few steps ahead of you in whatever journey in life that you want to be. If you want to be an engineer, call the engineer. Be an engineer. Tweet out at the engineer. They can respond. If you want to be a great athlete, go on YouTube and study that athlete and then reach out to them. And you'll be amazed that they can reach back and talk to the younger version of themselves and talk about the pitfalls, but also give you the cliff note version. That's, that's me dating myself. The cliff note mm -hmm. version of how you get the way you need. So, you know, I'm supremely proud of you guys. Again, uh, I'm, I'm astounded at the things that you guys are already doing. But just know this. 
however this world is going to turn out, it's going to be based on you guys. Let us deal with the racism. We're going to end it this generation. And you guys build the future now. You are the most diverse generation this country has ever seen. Keep being diverse. Keep treating each other like you want to be treated. And don't worry about all the noise. We will deal with the noise. You guys focus on you. I'm going to jump and have Leslie say something too as well. Right. So um, I will date myself. I'm 25, which means I'm very close to the generations coming up, but I'm also close to the generations who have passed high school age. And to me, it's really important that, first of all, I say I'm proud of you guys for making it through in pandemic times. Um, I know online school is awful. Um, it's very hard. You're not seeing your friends. You kind of miss them. But also, I want to say that it's important that you figure out where you're going in life because the past has already happened. You know, we're not in a position to go back to school five days a week in person. We're in a position where we're adjusting and you always have to learn how to pivot as you grow up. So that pivoting allows you to bounce from, you know, I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid. Now I want to be a lawyer. So pivoting is what makes life easier. Do not stay stuck in the road. Always, always learn to adjust to what's going on around you. Kudos. Wow. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, <laughs> we got people clapping the room. <laughs> and I'll end by saying this. So um, I'm going to tell a story. Um, I've told this story plenty of times before. In my front yard, I keep up an American flag that sits on a post in my front yard. And during the storms we had about three weeks ago, um, one of my neighbors came rushing on my door, banging on my door, banging on my door. And I'm like, what's the problem? She said, you got to take the flag down. You got to take the flag down. I said, why do I have to take my flag down? So I go out to the flag and I go watch and I go look at the flag. And the flag had been, from the storm, beaten and battered, like ripped up. And she said it was a sign of disrespect to have the flag out like that. Um, But because it was beaten up, it was torn, right? And God spoke to me in that moment. And he said to me, no, leave it up. And I'm like, why do you want me to leave this flag? Are you trying to get me roped off? I'm in Mableton. This is not the place where you want to do that. He said, leave it up. And he said that I want you to, every day you get up, I want you to realize that this is the America that you see, but it doesn't have to stay like this. He said, it may be ripped up. It may be torn. It may be dismantled right now. But if you can take, like attorney Greg said, go on YouTube, learn how to sew. (laughs) And you can take your time and patience to actually put work to it. Then we can rebuild this flag and we can make it better than it's ever been. So every day when I get up in the morning, I wake up with the mentality that, you know, what can I do to put that flag back together? Um, and I'm not going to take it down for everybody who's in Mableton upset because I need to be reminded that even though it's torn, even though it's ripped, it's still the United States of America. And even though it's torn, it's ripped, everything is still lined up. It just needs a little work. And it takes all of us to put in that work. So as far as I'm concerned, thank you, everybody on the panel who participated today. Um, we really do appreciate it. Kudos to all of you guys and for all that you guys do. Um, and we could not be who we are. and We could not do what we do without you guys. So at this time, I thank you guys. Hang out for me for one second, but we're going to stop the live feed. For those who are watching the live feed on Facebook, this will be on our Facebook forever and ever. It'll be on our website. Um, and for those parents who have been on as well, we appreciate you guys. And we want you to make sure that you continue to share this because we're going to still share this and we're going to still want people to watch the video all over the United States. Because um, I think this conversation was just that powerful. So thank you guys for coming out. Thank you for everybody who works for Black Push, who have participated in these events. Um, kudos to you guys and who are still here with me to seven o'clock at night and they've been here since 12 o'clock um, kudos to them and the work that they do um, every single day so thank you for watching and thank you for participating and hold on one second Leslie let me know when we're done live okay so thank you guys so much everybody um, literally thank you so we're done living so nothing that you're saying is being put out to the public um, I know attorney Griggs we got a meeting on Monday so we'll talk more Um, But I want to thank you guys for participating. Thank you guys for all that you do. Um, Thank you for your honesty. Um, And we're going to continue to do some work. And Judge Brown, I I missed, I was looking for the tea. You didn't sip not one. Where's the cup? I know you got to have one close to you. No? Hey, Judge. (laughs) (laughs) And Camille wants to say hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. She's my assistant and she's part of who makes us great. So thank you guys for everything that you guys do. Um, Thank you guys. We're going to continue to have this dialogue, but it's not 
just about this dialogue. Anybody who knows me know that it's the work we have to put in that goes behind this. So I appreciate everything that you guys do. And thank you. Thank you, Colonel Hutton, Pastor Musser, um, DA Patsy. I know you just came from a trip and you've been uh, had a long week. Attorney Gerald Griggs. Um, thank you, Vice Chairwoman um, Natalie. Natalie Hall. I'm sorry, I got so many names in my head right now. And thank you to the Honorable Judge um, Brown. I really do appreciate you guys for coming on and participating with us today. And we'll be in touch soon, everybody. Have a great day. Be good. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Bye, bestie. Oh. Okay, stop. Stop zone. And stop the zone. So in in the meeting fall. Thank you. Put that volume. Put that computer back on. I'm gonna plug all this back up. That's you stopped streaming, it. right? Let's yeah. It, it, it what was, you uh, you put everything on the computer. Not oh, you didn't stop streaming because it's still it's still on Facebook it's Live. Delayed. It's a delay. It's still, there's a delay. Delay. No. It's a delay. Everything I'm saying right now is still on there. I bet what you just said right now.